Well, I count it a real privilege to be able to come this morning and be able to share. It's been a while since I shared uh, in service, but uh, grief share is uh, very precious to my heart and to uh, all those that, uh, facilitators and my wife, Drew Stanell, and this year we have Preben, and uh, good to have them all on board with uh, the Grief Share ministry. Uh, Brent forgot one announcement, and that is right after the service. I know there's a meal for newcomers, but right after the service, we are having a special uh, grief support for all Edmonton Eskimo fans after that slaughter last night. <laughs> just, just so you know. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for your presence today. Thank you, Lord, that you are preparing our hearts for your glory. And uh, Lord, we just commit your word that your word would not return void and it would do exactly as you desire to do here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So how many here this morning remember the year 1977? All the young people snicker. <laughs> was that this century or is that next last century? Right? 1977 was a very important year for us. We were married in 1976. And 1977 was the birth of our first child, daughter. And uh, it was a great rejoicing for us as we welcomed her into the world. And at that time, we were at a Bible college uh, my wife and I had attended a small Bible college down at Caroline, Alberta. At that time, it was called Living Faith. It's now called Clearwater College. And I had the privilege to be chairman of the board now at that college. But uh, we were as students there, and then we went on staff for three years at the college. And during that time, uh, in the 70s, it was classified as a charismatic Bible college. So I don't know if you're familiar with the word of charismatic, but it was one of those uh, Bible colleges where uh, when you sang songs, people clapped their hands, people raised their hands, and there was even some jumping up and down like our young people do. Hey, that sounds like Sturgeon Alliance to me. It was a different time. But we were excited to be on staff. We were excited to have our first child Coming our way, uh, Wilma had already been in Edmonton because that's where her folks lived as, in preparation for her to go into labor. She went early. In the middle, of, while I was down at uh, Caroline, we had a family camp, and I was the main uh, song leader at family camp. And in those days, we didn't have worship bands like we do today. In those days, you had a single song leader, you had a pianist, and the songs were like this, so that's how you led in uh, worship at that time. But uh, in the middle of Bible camp, uh, Wilma went into labor. I got a phone call from, from her saying that she went into labor. I talked to the guest speaker for the camp, and he said, you're no good, get out of here, go to Edmonton. So I left and went to Edmonton. But wouldn't you know it, in the summer of 1977, there was a nurse's strike. Nurse's strike started July 4th. And Wilma went into labor July 10th. And we turned, across, we turned on the, the TV and listened to the 11 o'clock news at night. And at 11 o'clock, the news came. The nurse's strike was over. And the hospital where we would be going to for, uh, to, for Wilma to give birth was uh, now admitting patients. And so just after midnight, we drove to the general hospital in Edmonton, and they weren't going to let us in because they didn't know the nurse's strike was over in the emergency department. So we said, we had heard it on the news that you were accepting. So they had to go check it out, and they said, yes, we are, uh, we are admitting. Now remember that we were at this charismatic Bible college, right? 
where we were raising hands and getting all excited about the things the Lord was doing. So Wilma cautioned me when she went into labor. She said, Daryl, you need to stay calm. Don't get too excited. So I said, okay, I promise. So she went into labor. She went into the delivery room, and I stood right beside the doctor because I wasn't going to miss this miracle unfolding before my eyes. And as our daughter was being born, all of a sudden we hear, praise God, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. It was coming from Wilma. I thought, what? Is this, you're worried about me? It's you. It was an exciting time. What a great time and a thrill, and we will never forget uh, that birth of our daughter. Just as those overwhelming feelings were there for the birth of our daughter. So a death of a loved one brings overwhelming feelings. And it can infect us in all areas of our life. In the Grief Share program, emotions are illustrated by what is called a ball of emotions or a ball of grief. And uh, actually... Uh, we had to, Wilma had written to uh, Grief Share down in the States and had to contact H. Norman Wright and ask permission for us to use this today. But, so here it is. All the different emotions that you can feel when you're going through grief. It can go from uh, intense sorrow and devastation to anger, to rage, to bitterness, to abandonment, to helplessness, to resentment, to emptiness, to anguish, and despair. And you can feel all those things sometimes at the same time when grief comes your way. Grief can overwhelm an individual to the point of affecting you in every area of your life, emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, sometimes financially. Every area of your life, grief can touch. And so I wanted to share a few of my grief episodes through my life. So you can take that off, thank you. In the 1950s, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, so my mom's father, was diagnosed with cancer. And cancer in those days, the treatment for cancer is way different today than what it was back in the 50s. The doctors did an exploratory surgery on my grandfather, and I've been told that they opened him up and they closed him up, and there was nothing they could do. So in 1959, and I was four years old, my grandfather passed away. I have, very, I have no recollection, no memories of my grandfather, but I do of his death. And that is because when I was four years old, when he passed, my mother and her sisters, they had one brother who was killed in World War II, but her and her sisters decided that kids my age, around four, and younger should not go to the funeral. So here I was, I was being babysat by one of my cousins. I don't even remember which cousin it was. But I remember distinctly as a four-year-old the terror of death. Because when I was four years old, after the funeral, my mother and her sisters and her mother, my grandmother, all came running into the house and they were wailing and crying their eyes out. And they all ran to my grandmother's room, bedroom, and they shut the door. And here I was on the outside of that door, knocking. I want my mom, I want my mom, I want my mom. But she didn't come out. For me, death was terror as a four-year-old. It emotionally affected me. I had nightmares for years past. 
And not only at night, but also waking hours. Still remember pounding on that door. 63 years old now, I can still see me pounding on that door, wanting my mother. But because of death, it was terrible. It had affected me emotionally. Death can affect you spiritually. Four years, when I was four years old, it was not a good time in my life. Because when I was four years old, my parents divorced. My dad was, father was an alcoholic. And they split up, they divorced. And I never really had a close relationship with my dad. There's very few memories I have of my dad being at home as well, being four years old. Things that I can remember is when dad sometimes came home with his black lunch bucket from work, he would have a half a sandwich or something in there and Daryl got to eat the half sandwich. Probably was stale and dry and everything else, but it was special to me. The other two memories I have of my dad being home is running over my tricycle when he was stone drunk. And the other memory I have is when he was stone drunk sitting at the dinner table, falling asleep and his face landed in his plate of food. I never really had the close relationship as a father and son with him. I saw him once or twice a year after that, after the divorce, but the drinking never stopped. And in 1989, at the age of 69, he was diagnosed with emphysema. I thought the alcohol would kill him first, but it wasn't, it was the cigarettes. He was a chain smoker. He ended up with emphysema. He was out in Vancouver, he was basically penniless. He had a little dive in an apartment. I never did see that apartment. I'm glad I never saw it. But his family, his siblings, decided that since I was his son, it was my responsibility to take care of things. We didn't have a lot of money in those days. We were a struggling family, young family, three kids, not a great paying job. Thanks to the Benevolent Fund here at Sturgeon Alliance, they paid for a Greyhound bus ticket for me to go out to Vancouver and back again to take care of things. I did see my dad before he passed away I had invited him many times when he did visit us to come to Sturgeon Alliance to church. He always said no, because then I'd feel like a hypocrite. So he never came to church. But he did know the way. And he probably had heard it many times in places like Hope Mission or missions in Vancouver area, where I'm sure he frequented quite a bit. And I remember going into his room at the hospital in St. Paul's Hospital. It was almost like a bare hospital room. And I talked to him. And I said, Dad, do you know God is your Savior? And the words he said to me was, you mean Jesus as my Savior? That's the only thing he said. I have no idea whether he made a decision before he passed or not. But his death affected me spiritually because feelings that I was experiencing with my father's death were feelings of anger, rage, and bitterness. And not only at my father, but at God. And thinking, God, why did I have to grow up in the family that I did? God, why did you give me a father who was a drunkard? 
Why did you give me a father who I had no relationship with, who was penniless? What inheritance was there? Nothing. What relationship did I have? Nothing. But I realized that his death was affecting me spiritually. And that I had, I had a choice. And we have a choice when death comes our way. We can either turn to God or turn away. And I turned to God. And I asked God to take those feelings away from me. To take that bitterness out of my heart. And to set me free because it was binding me as a Christian, as a pastor. It was binding me. Those chains. We sang chain breaker. I needed the chain breaker to break those chains in my life. And he did. Praise God. He did. As I turned to him. And I think now, you know what? God is sovereign. God is supreme. He knows everything about you. He knows whatever your family background has been. He knows and has placed you in the families that he has. And the things that happen in your life are not per chance. And I realize that if God hadn't given me that type of father or had placed me in a home with divorced parents, maybe I would never have come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. But I praise God he did. But his death, my father's death, affected me spiritually. And then I was affected by a recent death physically. And that was the death of my mother. My mother got remarried. She and my stepdad had, uh, were married for 40 years. When my stepdad passed away, he was in long-term care. My mother had fallen. She was in a, nurse, in a lodge, like here in Gibbons. She, in Camero, she had fallen. She broke her pelvis. And it would never be healed again because she was 90 years old. And so she was in a wheelchair from that day on. But dad and mom got to spend the last three months of his life together in the nursing home. And they ate their meals together. And after my dad passed away, after my stepdad passed away, my mother's quality of life just went downhill from there. Her last couple of years of her life were spent getting up in the morning and because she had a broken pelvis, they had to use a lift to get her out of bed, to put her in the wheelchair, Then she would be wheeled down to the dining room where she would have breakfast. They would wheel her back in her room. She wouldn't turn the TV on. She wouldn't turn a radio on. She wouldn't turn music on. She just sat in her wheelchair looking at the clock until it was dinner time. And then they would come, take her to the bathroom, put her in the chair, Wheel her down to lunch. She would have lunch. Wheel back to her room. She sat in her wheelchair. Looked at the clock. They put her to bed for an afternoon nap. Got her up around 4 o'clock. She'd sit in her wheelchair. Looking at the clock until supper time. Took her down to the dining room. She ate supper. Went back to her room. Looked at the clock until bedtime. She spent two years at least like that. No quality of life. We got a call saying that she had stopped eating and that was in April. She was just eating a little tiny bit and then uh, we got another phone call saying that she was, the time had come and for me to go to Camrose and, and I, I was the youngest of the family. I was her baby. So, you know, being two years ago, I was 61 years old. doesn't matter how old you are. 
You're still your mom's baby if you're the baby of the family. Doesn't matter. I was her baby. And I wasn't going to leave her side. So I was there five days and five nights beside her. But what a difference. We sang her favorite. I had a stepbrother and a stepsister with me who actually were closer than my blood relatives, my own siblings. We sang hymns and we prayed. And my mom knew it was the end and that she was passing. And everyone who came into her room, she would put her arms up because she wanted to hug goodbye. Whether it was staff or family or the chaplain or the caretaker of the place, she had to hug everybody because she was saying goodbye. And it was a joy when she passed. And I was there when she passed. And the first things I said was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. She's finally gone. Finally. But I didn't realize that her death had affected me physically. I went to the doctor because I noticed that while I was there that I had gotten sores all over my legs. And I went to the doctor the same day that she passed here in Camrose, and I came to our doctor here in Gibbons, and he said I was cellulitis, and so he put me on extreme antibiotics and had me six weeks of stress leave because it affected me not spiritually, not emotionally. I was glad she was gone, but physically. And grief will do that. We never know how grief will affect us. So this morning I want to look at two accounts in the Bible. I want to look at one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And the Old Testament one is found in the book of Samuel. And it's the story of David, King David, losing his son Absalom. Now if you know the story, you know that Absalom was far from a model son. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, it talks about that he had took vengeance into his own hands. One of his stepbrothers had raped his sister. And so he went and he killed his stepbrother for doing it. He was vain. In 2 Samuel 14, listen to what it says. Starting in verse 25. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom, from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there is no blemish in him. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it, and its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard, which is about five pounds, his hair, or 2.3 kilos. He flaunted his position as the king's son in 2 Samuel 15. In the course of time, Absalom provided for himself a chariot. And not only did he have a chariot, he had 50 men run ahead of him wherever he went. So it was like in our days if he had this Lamborghini and he had 50 men on gold wind motorcycles leading the parade for Absalom, wherever he went. He was so proud of himself that he erected a monument to himself. In 2 Samuel chapter 18. And then he conspired against the king. Listen, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, 2 through 6, listen, he says, he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. And whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And then Absalom would add, If only I were appointed the judge. In the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me, and I would, re- would see that they receive justice. 
Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. Think that was enough? Not only conspired against the king, he was going to kill King David. 2 Samuel 15, 14 says, And David fled for his life. David packed up his family. In those days, in that culture, the kings had many wives and they had concubines. He packed up his family and left. He left ten concubines to his house to take care of his house. And what did Absalom do? Absalom pitched a tent on top of David's home and he slept with all his concubines. He openly slept with his concubines. And then he went to war against David. But he lost. He lost. David's army in 2 Samuel 18 says, David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel. And the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel's troops were routed by David's men. And the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside. And the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. And in the course of the war, Absalom was killed. And it's interesting if you know the story of Absalom, the account of Absalom, because of his vanity and his long flowing hair. I don't know why he wasn't in his chariot, but he was on a donkey. And they was, he was being chased, and as he went under an oak tree, his hair got caught in the oak tree branches, and the mule kept going. The donkey kept going. And here was Absalom hanging by his hair from the tree. That's a bad hair day. <laughs> and Joab the general came and took three spears and speared him, and then a bunch of his other men came and attacked him. Absalom was dead. How did David react? How did it affect David? I mean, his killer was now dead. He was free. He wasn't, didn't have to flee for his life anymore. 2 Samuel 18, 33. We read this. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And as he went... He said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Joab was told the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. And because on that day the troops heard it, heard it said the king is grieving for his son. The men stole into the city that day as men steal in who are shamed when they flee from battle. The king covered his face and cried aloud, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David's grief was so overwhelming that he lost all perspective. Didn't matter that he was the king of Israel. It didn't matter that they were victorious over Absalom. What mattered was that his son was dead. He was shaken, and he was shaken to the core. Yeah, his son was not a model son, but it affected him greatly. Even though his son would have killed him, David said, I would rather have died in his place. David's grief for his son affected the whole army. Instead of shouts and overwhelming joy of victory, they responded as if they had been defeated. They felt that it would have been better for them to die than for Absalom to die. So how do we compare that today? I mentioned that my mother's only brother passed away in World War II. He was in a bomber, and it was taking off. It was loaded bomb bomber from London Airport or wherever they were in England. And as the plane was taking off, uh, the, one of the tires blew, 
and it caused the whole plane to blow up. So uh, my only uncle from that side was gone. And you see the clips on video from the past, and you see the victory parades when the war was over, right? Remember seeing those? A lot of times it's New York City or somewhere like that, and you see the ticker tapes go flying and the cheers and everything else. But I wonder if the cheers were coming from the ones who lost loved ones in that war or any war. Changes. Grief makes a big difference. Let's go to the New Testament. John chapter 11. This is an exciting account. It's a wonderful story. It's a glorious story of Jesus raising Lazarus. John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Next one. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now listen to Thomas, one of the disciples. Didymus is his other name. Aren't you glad they called him Thomas? How would you like the name Didymus, right? Didymus Dion, right? No, Thomas. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Wow, what a noble character, right? On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. 
When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. Listen to Martha's reply. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, By this time is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. They don't have involvement like we have today, right? Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there? To see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? And I've been told the reason he called out Lazarus because if Jesus had just said, come forth, everybody would have come forth from that cemetery. Because he is the resurrection and the life. What an exciting time. Mary and Martha, though, they were filled with overwhelming grief. In fact, they blamed Jesus for his death of Lazarus, for the death of Lazarus. They blamed Jesus for Lazarus' death. We sent word to you, Jesus, that Lazarus was sick. Jesus, where were you? Why didn't you come sooner? Why didn't you heal him? Why did you wait till he was dead? You know, we may profess to be Christians, but at a sudden death of a loved one, due to illness or traumatic event, we ask the same questions. God, where were you? Why did you let this happen? Didn't you hear my prayers? Why didn't you answer my prayers? Why didn't you heal my loved one? Don't you care? But do you see the heart of Jesus in this account? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He felt their pain. He knew what he was going to do. He knew why he let Lazarus die. But he felt their sorrow. He identified with them. And he was grieving with them. God wants you to know, when you are grieving, he feels your pain. When you are grieving, he understands what you're going through. When you are grieving, he is there for you. When you are grieving, he will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. I love it that it says, he will walk with you through the valley. You see, you have people, when you're grieving, may say, haven't you gotten over it yet? You need to get over it. Are you kidding? Jesus doesn't expect us to get over 
death of a loved one. But he will help us and he will see us through the valley of the shadow of death. When you are grieving, he will comfort you. As the Beatitude says, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when you are grieving, Jesus is still the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. You know what the sad thing is about Lazarus? Is praise God. That was exciting. I would have loved to have been there to see Lazarus raised from the dead. But you know what? Lazarus had to die again. He had two deaths. Not too many people in the Bible have two deaths. And he had to die, not sickness, he died of old age. I wonder if he really wanted to come back again the first time. Jesus had a reason for it. Revelation chapter 21. One day we will see the reality of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Listen to verse 4. What a glorious verse. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or sickness or diseases or wheelchairs and walkers and canes and hospital lifts that lift you up. There will be no more of it. Praise God for one day. Praise God for one day. Do you praise God for that day? We have a poem that we share in Grief Share because a lot of times we don't understand why, why, why God. And the poem goes like this. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors. He worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly, will God unroll a canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the skillful, skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. When death happens in our lives, when things like this happen, we wonder why. And we look up and we see the dark threads and we see the mangled underside. But he is the resurrection and the life. And God sees as his sovereignty. He sees the tapestry for what it truly is with all the threads combined. And one day, as we love Jesus with all our heart, we will be there with him and we will see the tapestry and understand why and all our questions will be answered. Praise God for one day.